So we'll be in 2 Timothy. And uh, while you turn there, I'm going to pray for us. The Lord would speak to us. Father, we just thank you so much for your grace that you lavish on us, Lord. Thank you for your mercy that you grant us, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given us, placed in our hearts, God. And I pray that uh, the life of your Spirit would well up in this place this morning, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. Um, encourage us, God. Challenge us. Just pray you'd be magnified in this time, Lord. Magnify your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Timothy chapter 2. And we actually have spent a a um, lot of time in Second Timothy chapter 2 over about the last month, uh, starting with when Art came on Sunday afternoon and, and shared from the beginning of Second Timothy chapter 2. But I'm going to pick it up down in verse 14, and we're going to move through about halfway of the last half of this chapter. And so in verse 14, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so when Paul says, remind them of these things, what he's referencing is the things that he shared with Timothy prior in chapter 2. Um, and they are the big things in the life of a Christian. You know, we're always to be reminded about the most important things in the Christian life. And the most important thing is the grace of God. And he says in uh, chapter 2 verse 1. He, he told Timothy to be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he went on to talk about uh, warfare. Right? And the reality is the life of a Christian. Jesus calls all of us to be soldiers. To be warriors. The scripture says that we're Christ ambassadors. Right? We're all called into this great commission. And, and sin is so uh, easily interwoven in our lives if we're not careful. So we may not all be in a place where we are a soldier of God at this time. But we are all called to be a soldier. We're all called to be a warrior. And so he reminds uh, Timothy that, hey, listen, no soldier that's engaged in warfare, entangles himself with civilian affairs, with the affairs of this life, right? And, you know, husbands, fathers, mothers, it's not the idea of you don't uh, care about the things of this life or the affairs of this life. It's a man's responsibility. It's a parent's responsibility to provide for their children to make sure their children are taken care of it's a husband's responsibility to provide for his family so there are some practical affairs of this life that come every month for a husband and wife right but you're not to be engrossed in them you can't be entangled in them and I I just got the, the picture of um like a spider web because Spider webs are annoying, and, and in Florida, you can't see them. And a lot of times, sin can be that way. You, you, it, it's, you're easily entangled by it. But I, I have a lot of trees at my house, and so there's spider webs sometimes everywhere. And sometimes when I walk out to the car, 
and my wife knows this as well, you get hit with a spider web, and that thing seems to hang on to you for a couple hours, even while you're driving, you're feeling it in your hair, you're, you know, it's all, you're entangled in it, you can, and it seems like you can't even get away from it. And that, that's, how, that's how the things of this life can be. Um, they, are, they do entangle you in the sense that you don't realize that you're really entangled by them until you're in a place where you're just overwhelmed. We're sheep that are easily led astray. And as warriors for Jesus Christ, as soldiers, we should constantly uh, be examining ourselves and make sure that the glory of God that the gospel of Jesus Christ being lived out in my life is the chief aim. Because we don't want to be entangled. I don't want to be entangled by civilian affairs. There's too much anxiety and stress and all of that stuff. I want to be entangled with God's affairs. So he says, remind them of these. Remind them of the hardworking farmer. It's not just the farmer. It's the hardworking farmer. Remember the athlete that competes by the rules. Remember the fact that if we died with him, that if our life truly has been surrendered to Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 6, and we've been baptized into his death, we've also been raised into his life. So remind them, lest the cross be hard to bear, that if we've died with him, we also will live with him. Eternal life is for the believer, it's now for the believer. And there is life in God when we bear the cross, is there not? We have to be reminded of these things because it's hard to bear the cross, is it not? Especially if it's an area that's uh, super sensitive. It's hard to put yourself on that cross and trust that God has better for you. Remind them of these things. Remind them that if we endure all of God's people are called to endure. Hardships in this life are inescapable. The hardships of a Christian, the persecution of a Christian for the sake of the gospel that is guaranteed to all who will call, uh, live godly in Christ Jesus. We must endure. The scripture says to endure to the end. But be reminded that if we endure with him, we will also what? We will reign with him. There is a day coming in the day of Jesus Christ when God's people will reign with the king of glory. That is true, going to happen, imminently, matter of fact. So endure because you will reign with the Lord of all glory, with Jesus Christ. Remind them of these things. It's important to be reminded of the most potent things in the Christian life. Because endurance is potent in the Christian life. We all have to walk through tribulations and persecutions. But just as Paul said, the glory that is going to be revealed in us does not compare with these sufferings now. So he says, remind them of these things. And then he goes on to say, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. And what has long gone on um, in Timothy's ministry, if you will, and actually it's gone on since the beginning of time, when he told Adam and Eve in the garden, you can have everything, right? You can have all of what the garden uh, will avail you of. But you just must not eat of this tree because God is good. What did Satan do immediately? He took what God had said and he twisted it. And so Adam and Eve were led astray by the enemy. Deception has gone on since the very beginning. The enemy has used deception since the very beginning. And it's gone all throughout history. And even in this early church, it was already um, really running rampant in, in Ephesians. Not to backtrack, but just to kind of highlight the fact of in Ephesus, they had 
this princess Diana. It was, uh, her temple was one of the seven wonders of the world back in that day. It was like, uh, you know, amazing to look at in a worldly sense. And there's all types of idolatry running rampant in this society. So they're in a society that's just overwhelming. But not only that, um, Timothy has been called from the very beginning you remember in 1 Timothy to stand against false doctrines. And he's been called to stand against it like a warrior. And so what Paul tells, them, tells him is to charge these men. Charge them before the Lord. Command them in the name of the Lord not to teach these things. Not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. In verse 15, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, King James says, uh, Study to show yourself approved. But I think, honestly, the, you know, the better translation is to be diligent because the word speaks to earnestness, uh, diligence. And we, see, Timothy's ministry, he had to work hard as a minister of the gospel to stand up against opposition. Not only that, but to, to make sure that he himself was taking the word of God and rightly dividing it to where what he was sharing with the hearers was truly the word of God, that it was truth. And he says to do that diligently and to be a worker. And I know this morning, like not all of us are called to be uh, teachers, are called to be leaders or, or pastors. Scripture actually says not many of you um, should be called teachers because you face a stricter judgment. So I, I understand that a lot of what Paul was saying in this passage is directly um, aimed at Timothy. Because if he was going to stand against these false teachings that have came in and corrupted many people in the church... He needed to labor hard and diligent and long in the word of God. He had to be a worker of the word of God, if you will, to make sure that he was rightly dividing the word of God when he, stand, when he stood up against these false teachings. But to me, this verse applies to all of us in one way or another. The word of God Man, it is the most important thing in the Christian life. There, there can never be an overemphasis on the Word of God for the believer. There can never be. It is the most important thing. It is God's Word. And the Scripture says, Jesus Himself said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. And I'm reminded as well in, in Acts chapter 20. That Paul said that I have not shunned away from teaching you the whole counsel of God. And so for any, any parent, any leader, any teacher, it's important to teach your children, teach our children, instruct one another in the whole counsel of God. You can't pick and choose and do clip art just to make somebody feel good. But the reality is, 
ministers are doing that today and always have all across the globe. We need the whole counsel of God. We need, we need the, uh, the fearful things. We need the, um, the things that are encouraging. We need the whole counsel of God. We should strive to do that with our, with our children and with one another. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5. I want to point out a few things um, that directly point to the power of the Word of God in our lives. Hang on with me just a second. Uh, Verse 12. For now, by this time, you ought to be teachers. He says to them, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk, not solid food. And the the issue there is they've been taught these foundational things in the scripture. And they've come to a place because of complacency where they need to be taught those same things again. And he says it, it ought not be so. At this point, you should be on solid food. You should be eating the good stuff. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. See, a baby, um, you have to give him the milk. Right? You have to, you have to feed it to him or her. Sorry. Um, You've got to feed it to them. And what we're called to be is self-feeders. We'll look look in the, the passage here past it. Verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are full of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, to me, that's very powerful because we're called to have the solid food of God's word. And by reason of use, taking God's word, applying it into my life continually, by reason of use, our senses are heightened. And guess what? We can discern between good and evil. See, if you don't have a... a, a healthy diet because if you're eating solid food that's a healthy diet you're a full age you're a grown mature man or woman to have a healthy diet of the word of God if you don't have that you must you must realize that your senses towards what is good and evil will be dull in the things of God now we all have a conscience All of us have a conscience. So no one here would say uh, murder is right or stealing is right. But forgiveness, bearing with one another, loving one another, bearing the cross, those are, the, those are the rich truths, just some of them, in God's Word. And if, if we're not regularly eating the Word of God, regularly, our senses towards what is sin and what is not will be dull. And then what ultimately happens is we fall into sin. I'm sure some of us can testify to that. I can testify of it in my own life. When there's been a lack of intimacy, when there's been a lack of the Word of God in my life, there have been things that have crept into my life that I've had to realize, you know what? This does not honor the Lord. So the Word of God is is so important in that way for us. You remember the psalmist said, I've hidden your word in my heart 
that I might not sin against you. See, that's just not scanning it over and, and thinking that, you know, I, I, I know it, you know. I'm a pastor. I know the word, what have you. Hiding it in my heart. Planting it there in my heart that I might not sin against the Lord. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. And he meditates on it every once in a while. No. He meditates on it day and night. And this man that does that, what an amazing promise. Whatever he does shall prosper. <laughs> Even if it doesn't feel like it's prospering. It is prospering. God is receiving glory. And even when, it, even when he's out of season, it, the leaf's not going to wither in the dry times. The word of God, delighting on it day and night. We have such a need for that. Turn with me um, to Ephesians chapter 4. You don't have to show your hands, but does anybody here this morning feel like, you know, not, not from a, con, you know, necessarily a convicted, um, even mind frame, but feel like, man, you know what? I want more of the Word of God in my life. I feel that way. I want more of the Word of God in my life because I know the Scripture has said and I have tasted and seen that the, the Lord is good. And I know the power behind the word of God and how it can lift a soul out of despair and how it can and make a man of God stand up on the promises of God like a man, a woman of God, a woman of faith. I want more of the word of God in my life. We need this. We need this. Because the time in my life, right, on a day-by-day -day basis is literally being sucked in by like a 25-horsepower shop vac. There's so many things waging war on my time. Do you have things waging war on your time? And so oftentimes we can, we can put the Word of God in a place where it's secondary when it should be primary. Meditate on it day and night. Let not the law of God depart from your mouth. Hide it in your heart. We need this stuff. We need it, man. Verse 29. Not only do we need it individually. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. That's a sharp one. No corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. We've all done that to one another. And it was going on in Timothy's day. They had idle and pro, uh, profane babblings. There was all types of things being spread um, in this church in Ephesus. And what we're called to do is be those that share what is only necess uh, necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearer. But do you know you can never really truly impart grace upon somebody unless it's something that's in the Word of God? Because, you know, like the warm and fuzzy uh, statements, they won't do it, you know? What can, lift, what can lift a brother or sister out of despair is something from the Word of God. Something that is true and eternal and it will never fade. That will stand forever. Something from the word of God. That's what will give somebody hope. That's what will steer somebody in the right direction. So not only do we need it in my own life do I need it. I need it in my own life so I can be a true brother or sister or husband or wife to other brothers. To be able to encourage them th through the word of God. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 15. 
You guys tracking with me? I know it was cold and gloomy this morning. It's hard to get up, you know, just making sure everybody's all right. Got a pulse. It's like that, though, that cold weather. It feels good, especially under all the covers. But <laughs> Proverbs 15, verse 23. The second half, a word spoken in due season. How good is it? How good is that, man? Can you testify to a time when a brother or sister has shared something with you from the Word of God? And it has just been something that has just been, man, how good is it? It's been a lifter. It's been a source of encouragement and strength right in the time when you need it. And I want to be that for my brothers. I want to be that for my wife. I want to be that for my daughter as she grows older. Because at this point, you know, She's getting a few things, but she's not walking through the hard things yet. But we should want to be that with one another. The scripture also says in the New Testament to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And what he's talking about there is in community. He's not just talking about dwell in my own heart. He's talking about dwell in your midst richly, teaching, admonishing one another. So we need the word of God so bad. Come back to uh, 2 Timothy. Try and bring it back around. So if you see the value, you see the importance of the word of God, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed Rightly dividing the word of truth. Verse 16, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. That's so grieving to me. I, I just have to leave that one with the Lord because I, I, I struggle with that one. Um, and, and I'll tell you in a second. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth saying that the resurrection has already passed and they have overthrown the faith of some. And so Hymenaeus and Philetus, these are two guys that are named, that are marked. So what they've done in the church has been of such importance that Paul names them. And just the power of their false, their false doctrine, their false teaching, that's what I, I struggle with. Like, man, how can that be so? But I've just got to be reminded and encouraged in God's word because Paul says this thing can spread like a cancer. And I know people that have allowed doctrines and things to come in their life that are not, not of God. And they've just been shipwrecked, taken away, and now not even following the Lord at all. But that's also why there, it's so important to be diligent, to show ourselves as workers that need not be ashamed. Because deception is real, man. And it's so powerful that even Adam and Eve were taken away by it. Verse 19, here, here's the encouraging part. Nevertheless, even with all that so, you think about the day that we live in. And when you turn on your TV, the only thing being taught through a television when it has to do with the Word of God is pretty much, for the most part, false teaching. It's running rampant all over the place. And in other parts of the world, it's running rampant. It's running rampant in Nicaragua, all these other areas. 
And man, that's dis- is it not just discouraging on the surface to see like people led astray and shipwrecked by stuff that is so far off of what the Word of God says? Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And see, that's the awesome thing about the word of God. That no matter how bad or how strong deception may be, nothing stands against the word of God. Nothing. The foundation of God stands forever. The apostles' doctrine, the gospel of grace will always stand securely till the end of time. It's the eternal word of God. And there have been men and women across history who have tried to snuff out the word of God, but you can't stop the word of God. It stands forever Nothing can shake its foundation. And that's what's encouraging. And what's also encouraging is the first part of these two uh, seals that Paul talks about. When he says, the Lord knows who are his. That's awesome to me. Because what that lets me know is that as an elect of God, God chose me. God chose you. God came after me when I was not looking for the Lord Jesus Christ whatsoever. But God redeemed me from the dead way of life. God freed me of my sin. God chose me and he appointed me to bear fruit. God has chosen us. And if the God of all creation has chosen us, the comfort that I have is that no one can pluck me out of his hand. God knows those who are his. We don't know. He knows. So we also should never judge someone if they seem doctrinally off in some areas where the word of God is not lining up to what we know to be true. Lest we become one of those that are plucking wheat and tares at the same time. God knows. And the second part of this seal says, Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. See, and that's what happens uh, so often time with, with false teaching and those that bear the name of Christ. And there's been testimony of that over the years all over the place where false teachers have been um, found guilty of fraud and all over the place. But the reality is where there's not a solid foundation in the word of God, you can believe that iniquity is there. And he says all those who name the name of Christ shall depart from iniquity. If someone can help our our brother over there, I appreciate it. So it is. It is the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of of the gospel of grace that frees us from the power of sin alone it's not of works lest any man should boast but there is an important thing here uh, that should be a reality in our lives and that is if we name the name of Christ we should live a life that desires holiness. We should not be okay with indwelling sin 
in my life. I shouldn't be okay with it. Even though it might be <laughs> that I'm entangled and I can't get the spider web off of me. It doesn't matter where I go. It seems like it, I can't get freed of it. Even though that may be the case because sin can be that way for a season. Because God's got to break through in his kindness and in the power of his grace to be able to free us from that anyway. Repentance is granted. But you should never be in a place of compromise and be okay with it. You shouldn't. As a child of God, you should not. As one that names the name of Christ, you should not be okay with sexual immorality. You should not be okay with the illegal practices at work. You should not be okay with illegal practices when it comes in terms of government, in terms of taxes, you name it. You should not be okay with sin in your life. What we should ask is that God would grant us grace. Let us have grace that we may serve God in a way that is acceptable in reverence and godly fear. That's what we need is grace. See, these folks here, these false teachers, they were naming the name of Christ, but being holy, being like Jesus, pursuing God in that way was not part of their repertoire. They were in it for selfish gain. They were sharing false things so that they may bring others away. But still in our own lives, we should be those that are not okay with iniquity in my own life. I should not be okay with it. And, and hear me because the grace of God is more powerful than anything. And if you have sin in your life this morning that you can't seem to get away from, Man, just plead with the Lord for His grace. Because grace is so powerful. It can conquer anything in your life. It can. The grace of God can. But you've got a desire to be holy, man. You've got a desire to be like Jesus. And if that's your desire, the measure of grace that is available to you, you cannot measure So let us plead for his grace. And then we'll close with these two verses. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, if you, want to, if you cleanse yourself from those things that bring dishonor, sanctified and useful for the master and prepared for every good work. So in this great house known as the church of Jesus Christ, the reality is there's vessels of honor and there's vessels of dishonor. And only the Lord, hear me, only the Lord knows who are his. But we all call to cleanse ourselves from the things that bring dishonor. And I want to be useful to the master. You know, I want to be something that the Lord can take up. I just get the picture of like a, like a uh, samurai, you know, ninja or warrior. I want to be like a sword like that in the hands of the Lord that's able to penetrate a soul and watch that man or woman be changed by the gospel of grace and be born again. I want to I be that pillow, if you will, that's able to comfort a brother and sister. I want to be useful in the master's hands, man. I want to be a vessel of honor 
I want to bring God glory. But we have a part in it. That's why he says, if he cleanses himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about how we have this promise that God's going to be with us. He's going to write his law on our hearts. He's going to walk with us, be our God. Since we have that promise, everyone must purify himself from everything that contaminates body and spirit. We are called to fight sin. We cannot take the stance that because God is the only one that can deliver from sin, I'm just going to dwell in it and, you know, whatever. Wait on God. We can't be like that. We're God's people. So we have to cleanse ourselves. Let's turn to Titus um, chapter 2. I shared this briefly at 9 o'clock. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God has appeared to all men. And it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. See, if you don't deny ungodliness, you don't deny worldly lust, in your life, you will never be able to live, so. I will never be able to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. I will not be able to. That's why he calls us to bear the cross. If any man must follow me, he must pick up his cross and follow me. We have to deny ourself. We have to fight against sin. And we're looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Praise God. And purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. We are his chosen people. We are the church of the living God, the church of Jesus Christ. I want to be a vessel of honor. I want the church of Jesus Christ in my own life to be honored, to be glorified. That's why he says, the na- if you want to name the name of Christ, you must depart from iniquity. Because what a tragic thing it would be to bring blaspheme to the name of Jesus Christ by the way that we live, even though we name his name. And I just want to bring it full circle um, this morning. So go back to 2 Timothy. Because we are called to cleanse ourselves. We are called to depart from iniquity. And there is no way for that to happen in my life apart from the word of God. We need the word of God so bad. I mean, we need it so bad. The word of God... It's so amazing, man. It really is. Like what you see written in Psalm 119, that stuff is true. That stuff is so true. He says there that how can a young man cleanse his way? Or other translations say keep his way way pure. How can he do that? Somebody knows. By taking heed according to your word. There's no way for me to cleanse my way apart from the word of God. There's no way. There's no way to do that. But what's awesome is the word of God shines like a lamp into the innermost parts, right? It's the the double-edged sword. 
It's sharp. But what's awesome for the believer, man, is when the law of God shines its light on sin because there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Know that this morning. You're a born-again believer in Christ Jesus. When, when the Lord challenges you through the word, it's not condemnation. But the love of God through his Holy Spirit shines a light and shows you where you've been wrong. And there really is nothing like the word of God freeing you from sin. You following with me? There's nothing like that. Because when God speaks to you about sin in your life, there is no condemnation. There's hope. And there's transformation. So yeah, that thing hurts, right? He's, pr he's pruning every tree in here this morning. You know that? And the bigger branches, man, they, they get cut off and they hurt the worst. Right, Mark? They hurt the worst. But praise God because you're going to be more fruitful. That's what the Word of God promises. It's what Jesus declares. So I'm encouraged this morning because I love the Word of God. I, I, I do. I love the Word of God. I, I love it. But I want more of it. And I need more of it. You know, but... Yeah, there are things that are going to change in my life soon and I need more of the Word of God. Because if not, it's three verses one in my household. And apart from the Word of God, you can't uh, win that battle. But hear what I'm saying. I need more of the Word of God in my life. So the challenge as Drew and uh, Mary come up, if you're here this morning and you want to be a vessel of honor in the house of God, praise the Lord. There shouldn't be anybody here that's been born again that doesn't want to be a vessel of honor. If you don't want to be a vessel of honor, I challenge you to examine yourself and make sure Jesus Christ has truly stepped in and transformed your life by the gospel. Because when someone comes face to face with Jesus Christ in the cross, lives change. Lives are resurrected. Lives bring God glory. So you want to be a vessel of honor this morning. Praise God. I do too. But you cannot be apart from the word of God. You will not be. You won't be conformed into the image of Christ. You won't transform from one glory to another. So as we close in worship... Whatever it may look like to you, right? Um, because all of us are different. I'm talking about devotion time and God's word. We all need more of it. And so as we worship, you know, if, if the Lord speaks anything to you, what I would encourage you to do is make a commitment before the Lord this morning. To change something so that more of the Word of God can be in your life. So that you can have more time in God's presence. Because it's all, it is all the grace of God, man. It really is. It's all the grace of God. Victory over sin is all the grace of God. So just make that commitment before the Lord this morning as we can wor as we worship. I cannot overemphasize enough how much you need the word of God. I can't. 
So there might have to be some rearranging of, of lifestyle or, or this or that. But make that commitment and, and the promise and the word of God will come true. Your righteousness will shine like the noonday sun. It's not going to be, you know, flowery fields all the time. But God is going to transform your character, man. Lord, we thank you so much that we are your chosen people. Thank you, Lord, that you've brought us out of the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Thank you that we are priests. Thank you that we are your children, Lord. And Lord, we desire this morning for, for your church, God, to bring more glory to your name, Lord. And I know in myself and in our midst here, there's no way that you're going to receive more glory unless we're transformed more. We need your word, God. So I just, pray you, you, I just pray you would create a desire within every believer here this morning for the Word of God that is unquenchable. An unquenchable desire, Lord, that wouldn't be quenched by entertainment, that wouldn't be quenched uh, by laziness, that wouldn't be quenched by the worries of this life. Give us a desire for your Word that is unquenchable, God, that can only be quenched by the presence of your spirit, God. And I do pray that greater glory would come from it. In Jesus' name, amen.